stepping out of your comfort zone and experiencing new cultures and places that makes life feel so much more exciting. Whether it's trying new foods, exploring interesting places, or even just chatting with locals and learning about their way of life, travel opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Well, today's show is full of new experiences for you to try. We take off to Townsville and the Great Barrier Reef. There's skiing and stuff over in Japan, and a bit of zip lining through the trees in Kaipo Forest. Oh, <laughs> and me, I'm going on an adventure that's right here in Adelaide. This is the Oval Hotel where luxury meets sport. As a bit of a footy fan, I was pretty excited to discover the VIP experience packages. As a bit of a football fan, I was pretty excited to discover the VIP football experience package, which combines a stay in this incredible hotel with exclusive access to one of the best sporting events in the city. The package includes accommodation in one of the Oval Hotel's luxurious rooms or suites with stunning views of the Oval and the city skyline. And then there's my second favourite thing to do at the Oval. But the real highlight is being able to attend a football game at Adelaide Oval with access direct from the hotel. Your seats are some of the best in the house with access to premium restaurants, bars and food outlets. But the football experience isn't just about the games. It can also include a delicious breakfast at the hotel's acclaimed restaurant, Bespoke Wine Bar and Kitchen, and a behind-the-scenes tour of Adelaide Oval. Come to Townsville and you can't miss her. She's called the Ocean Siren, a glowing guardian of the Great Barrier Reef. And she lights the way to an amazing attraction. It's called the Museum of Underwater Art on the Great Barrier Reef and I can't wait to check it out. The museum lies in an open ocean about two hours off Townsville or 90 minutes from Magnetic Island. Jo and her team from ProDive run full day trips from Maggie to Moa on board Nautiful. Jo, this is not your traditional scuba diving boat, is it? No, so Nautiful is um, an old west coaster, so they're designed on the west coast mainly for um, prey fishing originally. So she's yeah, really designed for open oceans to be nice and stable out there. We're going about 34 nautical miles offshore today to get out to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so she's yeah, the perfect vessel to, to head out there. And this is our destination, the stunning John Brewer Reef, home to the Museum of Underwater Art. ProDive is one of only three operators bringing tourists here. On board today are two special passengers. I'd like to welcome you here today on Mumbra Sea Country, which is part of traditional owner sea country. John Santo and Gavin Kerr Palmer are newly trained Indigenous guides, fresh from a program to bring First Nation culture to tourism in the tropics. What can I expect when I go down there? Oh, you're going to see a vast range of coral sea life, fish, what we do on the EK side of things, planting of coral. The restock and revegetation is good for the reef. Gavin is an experienced free diver. I'm a Palm Island, I've dived since I was a little kid anyway, and just diving along the reef and just with the fishes every day is just 
unbelievable. Uh, it's amazing, like, never seen sculptures under the water. The first thing they're going to see is the big um, greenhouse structure at about 16 metres at the very bottom. So there's about 25 sculptures down there in total, I think eight of which are of people. And these are called the Reef Guardians. Within the greenhouse itself, there's people looking through microscopes. Just outside of the greenhouse, we've got some flower beds that they're actually doing coral planting projects in. It's been really interesting to watch that develop over the last year or so. There's a lot more marine life coming in to make it home, a lot more growth on the greenhouse itself. Mate, that was so spectacular, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It's like a little lost world down there, isn't it? I told you, eh? You hey, love it, eh? How good is it? We've seen the man-made attraction. Now let's check out nature's masterpiece. Snorkeling, what we're about to do, a completely different aspect of the race. You're seeing it from a different view. You get heaps of different of the little fish, which are amazing, amazing to see. It's about 600 different species of coral on the Great Barrier Reef, so lots to explore, heaps of different colours, um, lots of different patchwork in there. And plenty of marine life too, including this awesome looking critter. It's an extremely rare blanket octopus just cruising by. How cool is that? Townsville is your gateway to the Museum of Underwater Art. So what are you waiting for? Pro Dive run day trips to Moa, departing from Magnetic Island's Nelly Bay Marina, just a 20 minute Sea Link ferry ride from the mainland. The ski season in Japan typically runs from December through to early April. But you better start thinking about booking next season's ski trip now. Tegan Nash's trip to Japan will have you jumping online. I absolutely love travelling, experiencing different cultures, traditions and exploring. Today I am taking you along with me to wonderful Japan. Think fluffy snow, fresh food and culture. So let's get to our first stop. We flew into Tokyo, then caught the train two hours to Nazawa Onsen. Let's just have a moment to take in this. It is honestly so beautiful here. Well, no rest for the wicked. Time to clip in and experience the snow in Japan. And honestly, it was so fun zipping through all of these runs. And when it snows, you literally feel like you are in a fairy tale. From Nazawa Onsen to Nagano is about an hour and a half train ride, and I think you're going to like this. We have made our way to Jugokudani and we are looking for snow monkeys. These monkeys literally chill out in the natural hot springs and it's somewhere where you definitely want to visit. <laughs> From one side of Japan to another, we are now in Hokkaido. Woo! This is also a great spot for skiing, snowboarding and some snow ventures. Let's dive right in. We had so much fun wandering about the slopes. Now always be mindful when you're skiing in new places and make sure that you have a buddy with you. <laughs> These chairlifts had a protective screen and were an absolute lifesaver when it got cold. Of course, we had to do snow angels and then it was time for some food. Mm. This was a really cool experience. We learned how to make barmakuen, which is a dessert, a form of tea cake and originates from Germany. It's made by brushing batter over a rotating spit. When you cut into it, oh. you'll see all the different layers. Hmm. <laughs> Very, um, light. <laughs> you know, I'm always up for a little adrenaline and fun, so snow rafting is sure to get your heart racing as you zip through the snow fields. Make sure that you come prepared and are rugged up. I 
love experiencing unique stays and this ice village did not disappoint. Would you stay here overnight? Wow. This was a little icy and cold, but I can confirm that this was such an awesome experience. This is Japan's longest snow cart course. Snow carts in Tamamu. So how the brake works is that you just press down into the snow. That's it. You'll be riding 4.2 kilometers down mountain slopes and it is so fun. Love Japan and this trip doesn't even scratch the surface on things to do over there but if you want to escape the Australian summer then I would highly recommend looking into a winter wonderland holiday in Japan it's very exciting going to Japan on a ski trip especially for someone like me who has never seen snow thanks for that mum I need to know what do I need to take with me some of the things you might want to think about are some repray boots, tall boots, waterproof, preferably with quite a bit of grip on them. So you want to think about bringing some long socks, preferably something with some merino or some wool in them because they'll breathe a lot nicer. So you can wear them sort of multiple days in a row before they start to smell. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is probably some underlayers, so some thermals. Uh, it's just sort of a light, warmer layer to wear underneath your ski gear to keep you warm. And it also sort of helps you regulate your temperature in the snow. You find going to Japan, depending where you're going, whether you're going to Hokkaido up north or Hakuba a bit west of Tokyo, the temperatures can fluctuate a little bit, also depending on time of year. You probably might not need a mid-layer. It is nice to have though, and you can always take it off and add it as you need it. So it's just sort of options to have to keep you warm. Particularly if it's windy on the lift, you probably want to have something that's going to cover your nose and mouth. So most people will wear sort of a lightweight balaclava and it's handy to be able to sort of pull it down on your chin when you need to. A lot of people also wear a sort of neck fleece or a neck tube. The difference between pants and a bib is really, again, a personal preference. Whereas the bib is just going to keep that snow out from a lot higher. I also find they're more comfortable. I find people often overthink the jacket in that there's a lot of sort of different features that are listed on there. There's the waterproof rating, how warm it is. Whereas you can't really make a bad decision here. Every jacket here is going to do the job. Goggles are probably the most important thing in your kit. So you probably wouldn't go down a ski hill at 50 k's an hour without goggles on. The other thing good goggles will do is the technology in the lens will help filter out the light that comes through. On a cloudy day in the snow, the sky and the ground are the same colour. Uh, the good goggles will sort of filter out that light, enhance the contrast, and honestly, they're the difference between seeing a hole and going around it or just going straight into the hole. So a lot of people will start with gloves. Um, I think it's because people feel like they want that finger dexterity. You don't really get a lot of dexterity out of the gloves anyway. I'd probably recommend mitts over gloves. Uh, objectively, they're probably more comfortable and they're definitely warmer. But the thing with gloves and mitts is I'd probably, it's the one place I'd say definitely go Gore-Tex. If you've got wet hands, you've got cold hands. And what about the stuff that you can hire over there? What's the go with that? So when you get over there, you can hire most things. The main things you can't hire really are just your goggles and your gloves. The main things people will hire will be the hardware equipment. So they'll hire their helmet, their boots and their skis or their boots, board and bindings if they're snowboarding. So you've got your essentials, but what about those extra little things that could be a lifesaver? So there's a few little things that I'd recommend bringing that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, the first one would be a little tool to put in your pocket. So something with a screwdriver on it that you can make adjustments to your gear on the mountain if you need to. Yeah, so a lot of people when they head to the snow aren't really expecting the sun to be an issue. The snow is white, so the sun's reflecting off of it straight up to your face. So you'll see a lot of people come home with a goggle tan. So lip balm, sunscreen, even some zinc, definitely handy on those bluebird days. Stop you looking like a fool. And something else you might want to consider. Your phone loses charge quickly in the cold, so take a power bank with you. Take it everywhere. Trust me, you'll thank me later. 
You want to climb great heights like a possum on steroids or fly through the air like a sugar glider, then the new tree climb in the canopies of the Kaipo Forest is for you. First thing we're going to chuck on is the helmet. So you chuck that one on just like a normal bike helmet. Make sure it's nice and snug at the back. How does that feel? Perfect. Alrighty, now pull that nice and high. So this yep. is your shoulder strap. And I'm just going to tighten this waistband up above your hips. Sam, tell us, how did this whole concept, the idea of the tree climb come about? I guess we opened the one in Adelaide and we saw how successful it was with all the little ones and getting everyone away from social media and getting them off of their screens and into the treetops. And so Kaipo came about and pushed that through. It's good. We're getting the kids off the tablets. <laughs> yeah. oh, uh, there's heaps of different courses to truly test your nerve and skills, but I need some work. <laughs> and the most challenging is the grand adventure. The grand course entails four courses, one of those being our zip loop course, which flies over the Heisen Trail. Super exciting, fly through the trees. That's a two hour climb. There's three other courses, one of them being the green course, which is the easiest one, just so you can kind of warm up and see how you feel. The other two, one of them has a Tarzan swing where you clip up and jump off the edge. And then the red course is our hardest course, which has a rock climbing wall and a lot of difficult balancing obstacles. Ooh. And of course, this isn't just an outdoor adventurer's dream for a big kid like me. The kids course is for anyone taller than 100 centimetres and a minimum of three years old. It has 26 obstacles and there's three courses that the kids can kind of challenge themselves on which go from easier to hard. The adults can climb with their little ones if they're taller than 125 centimetres. So that's called the family experience ticket. So you can take them onto the grand course and show them the grand course, which is super exciting. So even if you think you're not fit enough, brave enough, or even strong enough, don't worry. Kaipo Tree Climb has got you covered. <laughs> At Tree Climb Kaipo Forest, we also have an all-inclusive nets course, which is for those people who are a little bit more nervous or just need a little more assistance. It's unharnessed and it's pretty much just a nets world above the tree canopies. Our cafe is for the parents who want to grab a nice warm coffee on a cold morning and watch their little ones climb. And the coffee machine is raring to go and nice and hot by about 9.30. We open every day of the week. 10 a.m. first climb. Last climb is 3 o'clock and that finishes at 5 o'clock. With the smell of the pine trees, the wind flowing through your hair, I guarantee, even if you arrive feeling a little bit scared, you'll definitely leave feeling absolutely pumped. We'll see you next time.